I have the distinct pleasure of introducing our speaker for tonight, Dr. Adrian Burke. Dr. Burke is a professor of archaeology at the University of Montreal, specializing in pre-contact archaeology of northeastern North America, specifically lithic technology and raw materials used to make stone tools. He studies the quarries where people extracted the raw material and how they exchanged, they were exchanged among indigenous groups at the time. In today's talk, titled Lithic Sourcing for Lake Paleo-Indian Sites in Southeastern Quebec and Links to Vermont, Dr. Bark is presenting recent research on the geologic resources, geologic sources of the material used to make stone tools at three Lake Paleo-Indian sites in Southeastern Quebec. Cliche Recor, Gaudreau, and Kruger II. The sites are located in the Eastern Townships of Quebec, close to the Vermont, New Hampshire, and Maine borders. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Burke. Thanks, Yvonne. It's uh, nice to be here. Nice to be with uh, my friends and colleagues from Vermont. I love Vermont. Unfortunately, I can't go there right now, but uh, hopefully I'll be allowed to go soon. Um, so I'm just going to start my timer here so I can stay on track and I'll share my screen with you. And hopefully that'll go to the full screen. And I'm hoping that everybody can see that well. And if there's any problem, I guess, Randall, you just tell me. Good? Okay. All right. So um, tonight I'll be talking about uh, three sites. I don't know why I am um, already on this slide. I'm sorry about that. Uh, I'll be talking about three sites in southeastern Quebec that are late paleo Indian sites that I've been working on. I've been analyzing the stone tools from these sites. Um, okay. Um, just a quick outline of what I'm going to be talking about. So I'm going to give a little bit of background on chronology and environment. Um, then I'll just a very quick word on how archaeologists can figure out that a stone tool comes from a specific place. In other words, the, the raw material, the, the rock, where it comes from. Uh, geologically or geographically and how it, you know, moved over large distances in some cases. Um, then I'll give three examples from uh, three different sites in southeastern Quebec. And then uh, at the end, I'll just sort of mention a couple of conclusions or implications for uh, paleo-Indians in this area of southeastern Quebec, but of course, Vermont and northern New York, uh, northern New England, excuse me. All right, so a uh, quick word on, on chronology. So uh, for those who don't, those of you who don't know the Paleo Union too well, this is, these are sort of the newer dates being used nowadays. Um, so in the Paleo Union in the Northeast, uh, especially in the area of Quebec and Northern England, uh, what, what's called the Middle Paleo Indian uh, is roughly from 12,200 to 11,600 uh, years before present calibrated. Um, then there's the late Paleo Indian, and which can be split into two parts, uh, 11,600 to 10,800, which would be the earlier part of the late Paleo Indian, and then a later part, which is 10,800 to 10,000 years BP, again calibrated. So I'll be talking about uh, three sites. They're called Clichancourt, Kruger II, and Godot. Um, they're all very close to each other. I'll show you a map. Um, Clichancourt is the only site in Quebec to date that has. Uh, fluted points on it. And they are called uh, Misho or Neponset style points. And these are dated to the Middle Paleo Union based on their style, the style of the, of the point. Um, then uh, Clichancourt also happens to have a, late, a later component, uh, which is dated to the Late Paleo Union. Um, and it has what's called agate basin type forms on it of bifaces and points. And then um, the site of Kruger II also has some of these agate basin type bifaces or points. And then into the later part of the late Paleo Union, we have Kruger II, which also happens to have this later component, Saint Anne, what's called St. Anne Varney points. I'll show you examples. And then the Godro site. So we kind of have a sequence here. Lishkankuo that takes us from the middle Paleo Union into the beginning of the late Paleo Union, Kruger II, which overlaps into the earlier part and the later part of the late Paleo Union and Godro, which is limited to only the later part of the late Paleo Union, roughly 10,800 to 10,000. 10, so 
the points we're talking about are, are like this. So the ones that they call agate basin or agate basin style are these on the left, A and B. These are from further west, so they're more larger, perhaps more perfect points. Uh, we call them agate basin-like because they kind of look like them, but they're not exactly perfect matches. Um, and then we're talking about these other points on the other end of the, of the late Paleo Indian, which are parallel flight points that are referred to as St. Anne or Varney points, St. Anne for Quitwigas Bay site and Varney farm site in Maine. And then in between, there's a different types like Daltons and high lows. Um, in Quebec, just as a, just as a note, um, we basically don't have these types. Uh, with the exception of maybe one high-low that I've seen in Gaspé at La Marthe and one possible high-low point at under the Richelieu River, um, actually very close to the Vermont border, Vermont, uh, uh, New York border. Okay, um, just a little bit about the environment. So we're talking about this area of southeastern Quebec, and of course here is uh, Vermont, New Hampshire, and Maine. <clears throat> and the sites we're talking about are, are these three here, Kruger II, Gaudreau, and Quichancourt. And as you can see, based on this reconstruction of the, uh, the ice front, um, by 13,000 years, um, the, these sites are, the, are already clear of the ice. And by the time they're occupied, which is about 11,000 years ago, the um, ice is, is quite far away on the other side of the St. Lawrence. And at that time, around let's say 11,000 years ago calibrated, there is instead of the Champlain Sea and instead of the St. Lawrence River, there's something in between that we call the Lampsilis Lake, which is mostly fresh water. And you can see the outline of it here. So it's kind of like a remnant of the Champlain Sea. It's not quite the St. Lawrence, but you can see that these people here are on the St. Francois River. And that is actually backing up here earlier on. And then eventually it empties out into the Lampsilis uh, Lake. But like I said, by the time uh, these other sites are occupied in the late Paleo Indian, the ice is pretty far away. In terms of the environment, in terms of, for example, the forest cover, uh, if we look at the late Paleo Indian period again, and we look at the area we're talking about, which is roughly here, the St. Francois River and the Megantic area, that's where the sites are. Um, essentially what this graph, this pollen, uh, chords tells you, or palynological um, sequence tells you, is that during the late Paleo-Indian, so the, for example, when Kruger II and Kluge-Vancouver are occupied, um, we're already into the, what's called the afforestation phase, which means there's already forests that are starting to replace the tundra, but these can be pretty open forests. They can be uh, spruce uh, parklands or open fir woodlands. And then in the later part of the late Paleo Union, so when Kruger II and Gaudreau are occupied, you have already, you're into pretty much closed forests, as you can see down here. So anything from a fir forest to possibly even some sugar maple forest already uh, in place in some parts of the eastern townships in that southeastern Quebec. So there's already, there are already forests and they're already starting to become more closed forests at this time. So it's not a tundra, it's not a taiga, it's, not re it's, it's definitely already forested, uh, especially in the valleys, of course. All right, so just be quickly before we move into the rocks and how they move around, um, I just thought I'd, I'd say a word about how I do my work because a lot of my work has, is actually more geological and uh, a lot of times, you know, people wonder how it is that uh, I know that a rock comes from a place and how do I analyze it. And basically the, what archeologists do is we use a lot of analytical techniques that are borrowed from chemistry and physics and geology and all kinds of other sciences. And we call these archeological sciences or archeometry. And I, I spend a lot of my time doing this. And, um, and basically um, what I do is I do a lot of geological work first. So I'll go in the, in the field, I, I look at geological maps and I kind of try and figure out where the outcrops are of rocks that might be interesting to me, that may have been used in the past by people to make stone tools. Um, and I go to these outcrops and I study them and take GPS locations. Then I, then I take samples, um, samples across the beds. I obviously, I look at it with, an eye of, with the eye of a, a 
of an archaeologist too, in the sense that I'm I'm interested in knowing, you know, is this any good to make stone tools with, for example. Um, then I take the samples back to the lab. We have a comparative collection. I can make thin sections out of it and do what's called thin section petrography. I can do geochemical analyses. I, I have a X-ray fluorescence uh, spectrometer uh, lab, so I can do the analyses in-house to study the real geochemistry of these rocks. And then we can even go to things like scanning electron microscopes, um, even higher, you know, higher magnification. So there's a lot of techniques that we use to make sure that we know that a rock comes from, is from one place and is then found on the site where, where we, we find it eventually as archaeologists. Of course, these, these materials have to get from point A to point B. Uh, this is just a quick slide to show you that, of course, we don't ex know exactly how it got from the source to the site, but there's different ways of knowing. You know, there's, there's obviously oral traditions, first nations oral traditionals. Uh, a trails like this map of the trails in New Hampshire that some of you might have seen. Uh, we can use GIS to lower to look at sort of like what's called least cost path analysis to go from you know the source to maybe a Paleo Indian site. Um, anyways, but that's a lot harder to know really for an archaeologist is you know how it got from point A to point B. Um, so anyways, um, what I wanted most basically talk to you about tonight is really um, examples of these uh, three sites that I've been studying over the last few years. Uh, I'll, Kruger two is the one that I just just finished so but uh, it'll, it'll be it's useful to sort of look at all three and um, so Klishkankur, uh, Godro, and Kruger two. So here's where they are. Um, so obviously you folks are here in Vermont Possibly you're somewhere else. I don't know because this is Zoom. Um, and uh, here's New Hampshire and Maine, and you can see the border right here. And as you can see, the sites are pretty close to the border, especially Um They're all three quite close to each other as well. Um, these two are on the St. Francis River. This one is more on the Chaudière and the Megantic uh, Lake Megantic uh, watershed. And what you see here in the triangles are basically uh, either known sources of raw materials uh, to make stone tools or ones that I've studied and could be potential sources. Um, and I've also included here, you know, the entire uh, Cheshire quartzite uh, outcrops going down Vermont, uh, Ossipi, that's the Ossipi ring dike, um, and, you know, other ones that you know probably pretty well, like Mount Kinyo and Blue Ridge, Braswa. Uh, Mansungan, etc. So there's a lot of potential sources and some of them even have quarries uh, associated with them, but not all of them. Sorry. Um, okay, so let's start with Krishanko because that is the oldest um, and it's, it's also an interesting site in that it has the fluted point component, as you can see here on the left, but it also has this unusual um, agate basin-like uh, component which uh, which Claude Chapdelaine associates with the late Paleo Union. And what's interesting is that as you can see, uh, most of this material is by faces and they're made out of kinyo rhyolite, except the kinyo rhyolite is heavily weathered. It's heavily weathered. Um, and it's really a pretty significant change from the early or middle Paleo Union, excuse me, uh, site, which has a lot of churts, including Mansungan chert and other churts, possibly from New York and uh, a series of other materials. Um, when, you, when you go to Kishankul, what happens is these people seem to focus almost exclusively on kinyo rhyolite to make their uh, large stemmed, usually, uh, bifaces that are typical of what we call agate basin-like in the east here. The Next site is Godro. Now I'm not in chronological order for a simple reason, and that is that this is the order that I've analyzed the sites, but it's also um, important to keep in mind that we're going from the sites from two sites that have not as good a, um, a context to a site that has much better context. So basically, Lishanku has uh, middle and late Paleo Indian, but the problem is that we can't really separate them out perfectly in the sense that they're not separated stratigraphically, they're somewhat separated horizontally, spatially, 
but there is definitely overlap at the site. So when you're studying, you can't be 100% sure that all the lithic material only comes from, let's say, the late Paleoindian. And the same is the case for Godro, which is in the later part of the late Paleoindian. So here now people are making parallel flake points here. And again, Godro is unfortunately, it's a super interesting site. It has, as you can see, a lot of these points, um, these parallel flake points. The problem is that it's a site that has everything. It has everything from late Paleoindian right through the archaic, right through to the woodland. And it is all mixed up in 30 centimeters of soil that's been trampled by horses and messed up. And uh, unfortunately, again, it's a bit hard to separate out things spatially, either horizontally, and certainly not really vertically. So what we did, or what Claude Chapdelaine did in his analysis was, he basically took the materials that are definitely diagnostically late Paleo-Indian, like these parallel flake points, and separated them out. And what he found was that Again, these people were focusing a lot on one material, except in this case, they were focusing on an, an unusual material that we hadn't seen before. And this, is, this was kind of new to us. Um, it was a bit unusual. We didn't know what it was at first. And uh, the archaeologist, uh, Claude Chapdelin and Eric Graillon, called it a rhyolite. And uh, at first I thought, yeah, maybe, maybe it's something like an um, uh, ignimbrite or you know, some kind of welded tuff or something like that. Um, but anyways, it was un unusual and very easy to recognize. So I think that any of you who would see this and held it in your hand, you'd say, wow, I think I've seen this before. Where did I see it? Except we had never seen it before until it was found on the site at the Godro site and associated only with the late Paleo Indian. Okay, so that's two sites. And like I said, unfortunately, with those two sites, we don't have a, we can't really care very, very reliably separate out only the late Paleo Indian. So I thought I would focus primarily tonight on Kruger II. And the reason for that is that I've, I have been able to analyze it and I just completed the publication for that. Um, and I've been able to look at all the tools more than once and the debitage and uh, really get a, you know, have a lot more time to look at it. And the other more important thing for our purpose is that we have, um, it's a site that looks like it's almost only late Paleo Indian. Now it has those two possible earlier part of late Paleo and later part of the late Paleo, but this site is also stratified. So it does have some vertical separation and stratification, which allows us to, um, you know, have a better sense of, you know, what's early and uh, what's, what's maybe the earlier stuff and what's the later stuff. I'll be just talking about primarily the latter part of the late Paleo Indian. So that parallel flake, uh, those parallel flake um, points and what goes with them. So Kruger II is different. Kruger II is, uh, it's, a, it's a very rich site. It has um, tons of projectile points and bifaces. And as you can see from this, there's quite a variability in the raw materials being used. So that's already a bit different than Kishkankur and, and Godreau. Um, and apart from the diagnostic things like this, amazing point, I think was re-glued from four pieces, um, you know, you have a lot of these retouched uh, parallel flake pieces, um, but you also have an amazing array of tools, large bifaces, drills, tons of drills, a lot of drills. Um, a lot of side scrapers, so the really tr very classic racloir, as, as we use the term in French, and something that's often really associated with the Paleo Indian in, in the Northeast. And then scrapers, of course, there's scrapers. There's not that many scrapers, to be honest. Uh, smaller scrapers, there's a lot more of these racloirs and, uh, and really a lot of drills and bifaces and uh, what we assume are projectiles. So it's, it's varied in the raw materials. And it's varied in, it's got a lot more tools in terms of the variety of tools that you find. It's, it's, so it's a better sample. And we know that it's essentially later late Paleo Indian. So St. Anne Varney or, or just that part of the late Paleo Indian. 
So what I did is I looked at the raw materials and because I have a comparative collection of, of raw materials from all the quarries in the Northeast, I was able to look at these sometimes just in, in, in magnification, just, you know, 20, 30 times magnification. In some cases we made thin section. Um, I wasn't able to do geochemistry this time, unfortunately, for this site because my lab is closed right now. I was able to do it for, for uh, some of the uh, Kishkan Kuo material, which was published, and then a few of the objects from Gaudreau, but nothing from uh, Kruger, unfortunately. So mostly what I'm looking, what, we're, what I'm talking about is lowered powered microscopy. So what you have here is, for example, on the left. So here are some tools made out of what we think is Kenyo rhyolite. Um, and here's an image on the left of a geological sample. The reason it's different is because this is weathered. This is the artifact that's weathered. And these are the feldspars that are weathered out. And these are these um, quartz beads, what we call quartz beads or little quartz eyes sometimes they're called. They're, they're basically little um, spherules of, of, of quartz. And so this is very diagnostic of, of Kenyo rhyolite, and most of you who've worked on a site with Kenyo rhyolite will probably recognize this. Unfortunately, the material though is very weathered. Um, there's also a red sort of mudstone that for, we didn't know where it was from initially. We knew there was some cobbles in the river, but there were, there were way too many large pieces that had uh, blocky surfaces on them. So we knew that there must be a quarry close by. And it's a very important material at the site. It, I, I chose to call it a red mudstone because I thought it was really not silicious enough, but I think it's actually more silicified than, than I initially thought. Um, and luckily enough, with, uh, with a lot of good luck and with a lot of also help from uh, a navigational archaeologist, Sylvain Rancourt, uh, last year, me and Sylvain were able to find the first quarry of this material in the Eastern Township in uh, only 27 kilometers from Kruger too. So this is a real quarry. This is material from the quarry, flakes, and these are the tools from Kruger too. And the batch is excellent. In fact, it's perfect. I've looked at it in the higher power microscopy. And uh, now I have some thin sections that I can start looking at, but I have no thin sections of the tools uh, yet from Kruger too. So eventually we'll have to do that. But the match is very, very good. So that's great. You know, we have a quarry. We, we have a good idea that it comes from there. You can see that a lot of this material is banded. So clearly banded the sedimentary layers, and you can see the banding very clearly in this red outcrop here from that quarry called Makwapskok uh, Rancourt. And Makwapskok is the Abenaki name for red, red rock. Okay, moving along. Uh, another material that's quite important is, uh, is uh, hornfells. Um, we don't, we don't hear a lot about Hornfels in the Northeast very often, but Hornfels is important. People who work in New Hampshire know that from the, Ossipi, the sites around Tamworth, Ossipi. And in Quebec, it's actually quite important too, but it's usually important in the late archaic and into the woodland, um, primarily because people don't seem to really bother to going too far to find raw materials, so they have it close by Montreal and the lower, in, in basically in the St. Lawrence, uh, the plain of St. Lawrence, there's a, it's about the only material you have. So that's what people use. But it turns out that at uh, Kruger too, Hornfels is very important material. It's in fact, it's, it's used a lot. And they managed to make absolutely incredible cases out of it, as you can see here on the right. Now, the thing about Hornfels is that it weathers very quickly. So within 500 years, this material, you can already have a hard time seeing the flake removal. Uh, here you can see it's weathered out, but fortunately it's still pretty in pretty good shape. And on the left here, you can see a sample from the quarry, the Hornfels quarry on Mount Royal, which is right in the middle of Montreal. It's a free contact quarry. And then uh, this is an outcrop of a new, uh, a new source that I found this summer, just a few weeks ago, uh, near Scottsdale. I had been there before, but I hadn't found any good stuff. And this year, I found some really good stuff. And I'll get back to that. Sorry. And then there's a whole bunch of other materials that, um, that some of you may know already. So obviously there's the Mount Jasper rhyolite that many of you are familiar with. Uh, Cheshire quartzite, of course, that everybody knows in Vermont. Uh, but these are materials that are present in very, very small numbers. So Mount Jasper, I think there's two bifaces and a big racroir, this one. Cheshire, I think there's a couple of biface fragments and maybe a scraper. 
And then in the chertz, there's a little more. And the chertz seem to be used primarily for scrapers, which is interesting, small scrapers. And, and then there's this material again, that really unusual material that we had found at Godreau for the first time, that we didn't know what it was. We called it a rhyolite. And, you know, we, we thought, man, what, what is this stuff? So, again, you know, doing the same process, if you take these, this is the bi a biface in, in Mount Jasper. You look at it, this is the weathered surface of the artifact. This is a fresh surface from the Mount Jasper quarry. Uh, these are the spherolites, these stringers made out of spherolites. This is, this is an excellent match. So we know that this is from Mount Jasper. Um, and then we have the Godro rhyolite. Well, the Godro rhyolite is very interesting. Like I said, at first I thought it was rhyolite. It turns out it probably isn't. So here's a couple of examples. These are up close um, images uh, at magnification 20 times, 50 times of, of this material. And this is a thin section image. And what you see in the thin section image is basically angular pieces here poorly sorted, some sorting possibly vertically this way. And these are, imagine, it's basically all quartz. But the quartz is not rounded. It's not like sand that's nice rounded sand on a beach. This is poorly sorted and not really rounded. It's sub-rounded, it's sub-angular. And so it turns out that this uh, material is not a rhyolite. It is what I would call a immature silicified sandstone. That's what I've chosen to call it for now. And of course, now uh, the question becomes, where does this uh, mystery material come from? Because now we have it at Kruger too, and we have it at Godreau. At Godreau, it's very Im important material. At Kruger too, it's less important. And so where does it come from? Well, here's one of the Vermont connections, other than the Cheshire Quartzite. Um, it turns out that uh, recently uh, there was some archaeological work done in Weybridge and uh, John Crock and Jess Robinson uh, mentioned to me that they, this material resembled a lot the material from, from Kruger and uh, they sent me a couple of samples and uh, I even made a thin section of one piece and it's a perfect match. In other words, this is the same material. The material Kruger too is the same material that's being used in, in the site in Weybridge, except the site in Weybridge seems to be late, late archaic, probably maybe Susquehanna, terminal archaic, something like that. And so at first I thought, well, this material must only be late paleo and now it turns out it's not. And what's more important is that at Weybridge, there's a lot of this material. It's so much that the archaeologists there assumed that it was a local material. Well, at Kruger, we have quite a bit of it, and at Godreau, there's even more of it. And of course, we assume that it was from Quebec. So the question now is, of course, uh, you know, where is the material from? And I'll try, I'll get back to this right at the end. So just to, um, just to recap then, with Kruger II, uh, which like I said, is kind of the best collection because it's the biggest, it's like the one that we can pretty much say it's only late Paleo-Indian. Um, if, if we look at, at Kruger II and the potential, potential sources, here's, here's where the material comes from. So basically what I did is I made a table where I kind of split something up into local, regional, and extra regional, meaning from more than 500 kilometers. And what you can see is basically that there's a lot of material that's local coming from river cobbles and, and veins like the quartz and some of that red mudstone is local and it's in cobble form. It's definitely used in cobble form sometimes, not often. Then there's a, a lot of regional material. So material that comes from less than 100 kilometers away, uh, possibly that, that uh, rhyolite, the Godro immature solidified sandstone, Kenyo rhyolite, uh, Montagne de Marbe, uh, which is, um, I'll show you on the map again, that new quarry of the red material, uh, the local gray mudstone, which almost certainly comes from the same quarry. In fact, we have samples now, we've, we've found samples of the gray and red. Uh, the hornfells, there's lots of sources of hornfells in the area, many actually, potential sources. And then uh, again, there's quartz in, in, in vein form. So, so there's actually a lot of local and regional material on this site. And then there's a little bit of, of non-local material um, there's the, oh, sorry, so the Kenyo rhyolite is definitely non-local. I'm, I'm sorry, I, I was mentioning Montaigne de Mau because 
the there's there's a lookalike there, so I'll get back to that. But basically, we have Kinyo, which is definitely from 170 kilometers away, which is quite far away. Uh, we have Mount Jasper, which is 126, except Mount Jasper, like I said, is barely present. It's just a couple of tools. Um, we have the uh, some unknown rhyolites that are probably from further away. Some hornfells that may come from further away, but I think it's local. Cherts that are definitely out from outside the region, but there's not a lot of it. And Cheshire Quartzite, but again, like I mentioned, the it's only present in a few tools. So the exception really is the Kinyo, and we'll I'll show you why that is. So here's a a, um, a table where I basically tried to summarize the use of materials by the different tool types. And what I did is I tried to rank them. So I, I put them in order first of their importance. So by faces, this is order of importance in percentage. So going from, you know, Kenya rhyolite to a local red mudstone to horn fells to Godro rhyolite to the local red mudstone to a chert, and then there's some undetermined stuff, and then it's quartz, ry undetermined rhyolite, gesture quartz site, and New Hampshire rhyolite. But by then you're talking about three or four tools at most. And then it did the same thing for the points, put them in order, the drills, put them in order, the unit faces. That's basically like scrapers and, and, and side scrapers and uh, retouch flakes, the debitage here and then the global rank. So what I did was then I split them. Uh, the colors basically show you red is more than 15% of, let's say the bifaces, blue is five to 15% of the bifaces and green is less than 5%. And then I created ranks. So what I did is I basically summed up these orders and ranks. And basically in the first rank in the most important materials are Kinyo Rhyolite, the local red mudstone from that quarry, and then a horn fells, which probably comes from within the region, let's say less than 100 kilometers. In your second rank, in the second group, you have that unknown rhyolite. We don't know where it's from. I would call it now an immature silicified sandstone. Uh, the local red mudstone, which probably comes from that same quarry, that local quarry, chert, which is probably mostly from outside the region, almost certainly quartz, which could be in cobble form or local veins. And then there's a third group, which is this group of material that's really present only in very small numbers, like uh, Cheshire Quartzite or New Hampshire Rhyolite, but still important because it shows us our, uh, those connections again to other places. To the south. So what we're looking at here is essentially Kinyo Rhyolite, which is a material that comes from 170 kilometers away, and then some local materials 27 kilometers away, and then some regional materials that are pretty much dominant. In almost everything except for, for example, uh, there are some things in which chert is important. For example, chert is very important for the unifaces, for the scrapers, the side scrapers, the retouch flakes. So that's interesting because it shows you that it's not, these materials are not necessarily the first choice to make scrapers. And that's actually something that we see quite often when it comes to making uh, scrapers. They, people want finer materials, materials that are uh, much finer grained. And then there's the debitage. I, I only used the area three debitage here because that was the most uh, carefully analyzed, but we can also look at the ranking for the whole site. But again, the rank for the debitage is pretty close, again, to you know, the rhyolites and this. So the, in the top rank, you see, you see roughly the same material for the, the debitage, for example. Um, the cores, we can't really talk much about because most of, the, most of the time, like other than the quartz where there's about 20 cores, everything else, there's maybe one or two cores. So I, they're ranked like second or third, but really what the, all that means is that there's one or two cores of that material. It's not really uh, significant. There's in fact, there's very few cores at this site, which is kind of strange. Okay, so what does this all mean if we try to look at it on a map? So basically, if we try and look at the use of the materials, the first thing that we see is um, what I did is I added one other source, this new source of hornfells that I found this summer. And if we if we add that in, what we see is that there is a pretty important use of of what I would call local to regional materials, especially that red and gray mudstone and some hornfells um, that probably comes from within uh, fifty. 
or maybe you know about 50 kilometers of the site. And that includes, you can see Godro is within that uh, ellipse here. So it makes sense that they're kind of in the same gang. Uh, the problem at Godro is that we, they seem to be using primarily that other material that we don't know its origin. But the thing is that this doesn't obviously tell all the whole story because then we have a lot of Mount Kenya rhyolite. Like, I mean, a lot. It is the number one material in almost every category except for scrapers. It's even used for drills, it's used for points, it's used for five faces. Uh, and so that's absolutely cannot be ignored. So there's a very strong connection east west between the people at Godro Kruger II and Klishanku. Remember that they were using that Kenya rhyolite as well and Mount Kenya. Now, the only little catch here that I'd like to mention is that there is a source here that you see that's, that I've mentioned is Montan de Mount. And at Montan de Mount, there is rhyolite, and some of that rhyolite is a dead ringer for Mount Kenya. And I was just there a couple of weeks ago. I wasn't able to get up onto the cliff face because it's very dangerous, but, and it was raining very hard, but I have to go back. I've been there four times, and uh, I, I think that maybe some of the Kenya material may actually come from a more close source, but that's yet to be proven. Ledridge is absolutely not present at any of these sites. Moen Lefai is not present. Uh, uh, this uh, is another Hornfels that could be present. And then the other connections are to the south with Vermont. Uh, there is some Hathaway chert, uh, primarily in the form of a couple of scrapers. There is some Cheshire, like I mentioned, that biface fragment, a, a scraper. And then there's that material that's found in Weybridge in large amounts. And so the question is, if that material, that unusual material, actually comes from this area of Vermont, let's say, and not from this part of Quebec, then it makes for a much stronger connection down to Vermont. Otherwise, it's just a few objects that are making it back and forth. Um, the problem right now for us is that if you look at Kruger 2, it's an unusual site in that it has a lot more variety of tools and a lot more variety of materials. And, but at the same time, um, I'm hesitant to say that, um, that a group would go all the way to Kinyo within a year, but then also manage to go down, let's say, to Hathaway and partway down Vermont and then come back. It seems to me that another possible way to explain this is that maybe there's two groups that meet at Kruger, that's a possibility, or that maybe Kruger is just a site where people come back to every once in a while when sometimes they go east-west and sometimes they go north-south. And then Mount Jasper, for example, I've left out because it's only two bifaces and a side scraper. And as you know, uh, moving east-west across these mountains is not easy, so it's probably moving this way and it may have been obtained from another group or somehow through exchange. So it's hard to tell right now. So that's where it's at. I, there's no absolute conclusive answer to where these people were going and living within the year, but we have a pretty good idea of their area of, of their territory that they cover, as well as their relationships possibly with other groups in the area. By the way, there's no Monsungan around Mountain or Quebec City Church. At these sites. So, um, to conclude, uh, there's one. Th the first thing that's interesting is that there's definitely a change in the in raw material used from the middle to the late Paleo Indian, at least at these three sites. Um, the late Paleo Indians at these sites seem to use a higher proportion of regional sources. So that's really kind of a newer thing, like using all kinds of materials, a lot more hornfells, a lot of this mudstone, which is not really the best material, but they still manage to make amazing things with it. Uh, hornfells is not an easy material to uh, flint down, by the way. Um, and the reason that, the, that, for example, Kruger II happens to be different is that Almost all of the other late Paleo Indian sites that I've actually been able to work on, whether it's in Gaspé, where I worked at La Marthe and those sites, or the Rimouski site that actually was part of, uh, of the analysis and the cataloging, or uh, Varney Farm in Maine, um, and Godreau in Clichancourt, and are the, these sites almost always focus on one or two raw materials. In other words, they're really, really like there's maybe one material that is really dominant. 
Kruger II is very different. In other words, it has all kinds of materials, There's definitely some that are more popular than others, but it has all kinds of materials, a lot of them from within the you know, region, let's say 70 to 80 kilometers. And um, my suggestion is that uh, it's because this site is, a, is, a, is an unusual site. In other words, it's either a site that people are coming back to often, but maybe from different areas, or possibly a site where different groups are meeting, uh, using an older term, different bands of, of Paleo Indians that are, that are meeting in this part of Southeastern Quebec. Some coming from Vermont and some coming from further east, like towards Maine and, and McGann. And that's it. So thank you very much. And I guess time for questions. And I will stop my... I just want you to thank these people. So I'll let you read that quickly. There's a lot of people to thank, including, of course, John Croc and Jess Robinson and Jeff Mandel, um, and some geologists, including my wife, who's a geologist from Vermont. Uh, so it, obviously, a lot of people to thank. All right. Awesome. Well, thank you. Um, so we did have one question come through from, from Dave Lacey. Uh, and I'm going to click the answer live and see. And can you see Is it those? about Cheshire Quartz site? <laughs> can you see those? By any chance? Areas? I can read them out. Um, at the Kruger 2 site, did you see spatial clustering, vertically or horizontally, of the many diagnostics? Or alternate, alternately, were they all mixed in what appears to be a context with pretty good integrity? Uh, I know this is going to be a disappointing answer, but uh, you'll have to wait for the book. And that's really, uh, the book is, is literally gone to the printers. And um, it's at the printers. And if you know Claude Chapdelaine, if you know anything about Claude Chapdelaine, you're going to have it within a month or two, because he's unbelievable. Um, so my job was just to tell him where the rocks came from. Uh, the, there is definitely some vertical stratigraphy. They were able to go to, you know, pretty deep. In some cases, one meter. For us, is, that's deep. Um, but Kruger, too, is unusual. It's kind of like in a rock outcrop. And then there's some places where there's gaps, where sort of the fine sediments, like uh, really fine alluvium and possibly even sand, windblown sand. I don't know if they did an, an analysis. Um, has accumulated, and so that's allowed them to find features even further down. Uh, but the problem is that it also limits a bit of the spatial uh, resolution because sometimes you just literally end up in a place where it's a rock outcrop, and then you have no no site left, and then you start again. So they've done some spatial analyses of the different areas that they excavated, comparing them for example, for the debitage and the tools and all that. Um, and then within the couple of places of the site where it's deeper, they've done analyses vertically to see if they can see uh, changes. Um, but honestly, that's out of my uh, expertise. In other words, I, I've mostly been focusing on the raw materials, and, and, uh, but I, I know that, that you'll have all those answers soon. Thank you. Um, so we have a question from Peter Cobb. Uh, do you have a sense of where the manufacturing is taking place, near quarries, at sites, or elsewhere? Yeah, so um, in terms of the debitage, I do actually have some pretty good um, uh, data on the debitage. I mean, there's, there's a lot of, of, of biface thinning happening at the site. But what's interesting is that it's, you know, considering the number of bifaces, that's not surprising. Um, there's, there's, uh, there's very few cores. So that's one thing that I mentioned, like other than the 20 quartz cores, which are basically just bashed, you know, bipolar pieces, probably, uh, there's literally like, you know, a handful of cores. So there's no cores making it to the site. What they're doing is they're essentially showing up with blanks and preforms, bifacial blanks and preforms, and finishing them. And that includes even that, that local quarry, the red, uh, the red mudstone quarry. They are not showing up with blocks. They're not showing up with, um, I'd say, even relatively advanced preforms. In other words, they're, they're definitely showing up with blanks, but I'd say even more so with, with pretty decent preforms. And, 
The only thing that I wasn't able to do, because I, I, I do do a lot of technological analysis myself, but the way that the project was organized, I wasn't able to do this, but essentially, well, in North America, unfortunately, we tend to kind of separate debitage from tools. And of course, in the European tradition, you don't do that. And, and you know, you have one analyst do one and then somebody else do the other. And the thing is that when you can integrate the two, um, what we need to do is, for example, uh, look at, you know, in terms of the raw materials, separate out each chain operatoire for each raw material look at what stage of you know the biface if you want to use callahan stage let's say of reduction it shows up on the site right um but for example one very interesting thing that i mentioned in my chapter is we have no clue what the chaîne opératoire is in other words the sequence that leads to the production of those drills okay i can pretty much figure out how those big bifaces those big wide flat bifaces made out of mudstone horn fells Kinio rhyolite or look lookalike are, are made because they're classic. There's those super flat flakes, very uh, wide flakes. Um, we understand that. We understand how that makes it on to further steps, even towards the um, parallel flake points, because we studied that at places like La Marthe, where we've got the quarries and the workshops, and we have the whole sequence, and we we've studied it in detail. Manikal Atkar has written a 700 page PhD on it if you're interested in it. So we understand that part, but how do you do the drills? There are dozens and dozens and dozens of drills, and I don't see the step before that at this site. I'd love to know, for example, what they show up with at the site to make those drills, for example. And they're nothing, by the way, like the drills at Bullbrook. I, I was part of the Bullbrook study with, with uh, Brian Robinson and Jen Ort, and I saw those drills, they're totally different. There's a completely different thing. These are basically bifacial pieces that are that are narrowed down, but there there's so many. It's crazy. And they're making out of out of hornfells too in Kenya. It's crazy. They're making it out of the only thing they don't use to make the drills is the mudstone, which is interesting. Awesome. Well, thank you. Um, Another question from, from Dave Lacey. Do you have any insight or speculation about the relative territoriality of lithic slash quarry sources? I, I mean, I think I know where Dave's going with this he, in terms of access or limited access or controlling access. Uh, uh, no, I have, I have, I, I don't think I will, can make a statement on that. One thing that, that still stumps me is Kenya rhyolite, if it's Kenya rhyolite, is like, I mean, it's dominant, truly dominant at the site, Kruger too, and also at Clichon Cool, by the way, uh, for the late paleo. Um, but for example, when I did a geochemical analysis of a whole bunch of other rhyolites at Clichon Cool, I had a pretty good match for Montagne de Mal. And I also had this lookalite at Montagne de Mal. So if that, if that, changes and I eventually have to conclude that it's not Kenyo but this other rock then I could say well yeah maybe that's their material that's their signature material it's it, it's like the Godro stuff is that that other signature material and maybe they control access to it because for example Kenyo we find everywhere but the Godro material I have seen in only at two other sites in my life there is one large rock lar at Crown Point in that mixed Paleo Indian site on the New York side, just across from Vermont. And there's one biface in La Colle, which I found in a collection, an old collection made out of that material. And it is a late Paleo uh, biface found at La Colle. And La Colle, as you know, is literally on the border with New York and Vermont. It is the, you know, the border crossing. And then there's some, obviously, the later the material at Weybridge, but in terms of Paleo stuff, there's only two other tools, to my knowledge, found to date. So there is possibly a kind of a signature material, like that Weybridge material or Godro material, call it whatever, or possibly these, this Kinyo type material for late Paleo Indians. Um, but in terms of accessibility or limiting access, no idea. Thank you. Um, a question from Daniel Cassidy asking if you could recap again, what artifact forms were represented in the Mount Jasper material? Two large bifaces, one large side scraper. And 
I would not be surprised if we find the other parts of that biface eventually, because there's almost no, no flakes of it. But I think, they, I think somehow they got their hands on two really nice big bifaces and one large sky, skyscraper. You can tell that it's a nice, huge flake blank, maybe coming off of a large biface as well. But that's it. Awesome. Uh, so a question from Jess Robinson. Uh, thank you so much, Adrian. I could ask a million questions, but one I would ask that might take you out of your comfort zone is what do you make of the fairly stark movement from the church? Yeah, I, I mean, they don't abandon church. They still, they still um, use it for the scrapers and stuff, and uh, they still seem to really like it for some stuff. Um, I did identify some shirts that were definitely Appalachian shirts um, because they have the radiolaria and they have the bioturbation and they're there. But the problem is that, you know, they could be from a whole bunch of places, but I'm, I'm pretty sure that a couple of them could from very likely come from Hathaway. It would make sense. Um, but the, the problem, I also found a couple that had fossils that would place them uh, in Southern Ontario or New York. So, there's a couple of pieces that are coming from further away, but why do they just give up on Monsungan, for example, when they're at Kinyo? I mean, there, there's like, you know, I, I, don't, I don't get it. I don't really understand it. There's no other good source of chert nearby. So there's a chert at Mont Elephant, which you probably saw on the map. That chert's not great, and I almost never find it on our sites. There's Ledge Ridge, not present. So there is a piece of Ledge Ridge chert at Godreau, but it's in an archaic form. Very interesting. One piece. Uh, so, and as you know, I was able to demonstrate that there was no Ledge Ridge at Clich Cancourt, none, that's published. And I've sampled Ledge Ridge like nobody's ever sampled Ledge Ridge. I mean, it's, it's been, it'll be published soon. I, I sent it for publication. I don't know when it's gonna come out, but I mean, that stuff's not there. So there are shirts that we know about that are local or regional that are not used. And they, for a while, they, they're crazy about Monsungan and then it just drops off of the face of the earth. But they, they seem to still like to have the odd piece from, uh, from the Appalachians. Um, it, I guess it, it could come from Quebec City, but it doesn't match the samples that I have from Quebec City. I think it's coming from the South. I think it's coming from Vermont and then maybe a couple of pieces from further West. And that's it. But I think it's really mostly in the in the in the um, in the scrapers. The odd um, the odd um, uh, drill. There's one drill that I can think of, and there are two point bases that are notched uh, at Kruger too that are made out of a black shirt with radiolaria in it. Thank you. Um, so we have a question from Angela Labrador. Do you plan to continue researching the lingering questions of the East, West and North, South connections at Kruger too? If so, what are your next steps to help refine this? Well, one of the steps was I was supposed to go to Vermont and keep looking for that material. I mean, uh, John Crock and I spent a day near Weybridge. Um, it happens to be really close to where my wife's from, Bristol, so it was easy. Uh, right next to Ad it's a field days. If any of you have been ever to Addison County Fair, it's uh, literally right there. And uh, I think there's some good potential. I've looked at the geology and looked at it, and I, I did a whole transect. I started at, at Lake Champlain, south of Burlington, and followed a bunch of outcrops and and got some samples that look good. But um, to be honest, that's what I have. That's what we have to do. It's just more field work, and it's the same. Like that's what I did um, just a few weeks ago in eastern townships. I have to go back to Montagne de Mar. Every time I go there, it's just like I think I'm never going to make it out of there alive. It's uh, it's like it's it's really scary. Um, they I have to go back to Scottstown. I have I have really good feeling about that Hornfell source. I think there might be a quarry there. We have to spend more time at that new quarry, the Red Mudstone Quarry. And then, you know, Kenyo we know pretty well. And thanks to work by our colleagues in Maine and also uh, Ian Putnam, who did his master's on it, I think we have a good handle about Kenyo, you know, and Braswa and Blue Ridge. Uh, but then if I go to Montagne de Maub and I found something that's exactly the same, then that's going to be tougher. And when I compared it geochemically, the two, I was able to tell them apart. 
So if I actually find a good outcrop and a quarry, and then we can properly sample it, then I'll have an answer to that question. And then of course, the other thing is we just have to hope that somebody in Vermont, an avocational archeologist, uh, somebody who's just super keen, a geologist who just says, wow, yeah, that's a weird rock. I think I've seen that. Just literally by sheer luck says, yeah, this is, I can take you where that rock is from because that's how we're going to find it. I could, I could walk around in the woods for the next 50 years. I'm sure I won't find it, but I like walking around in the woods. Though, so it's good. <laughs> um, thank you. Uh, a question from Jesse Liang. For thin sections, do you analyze them by appearance or composition as well to determine the raw material? So I, I thin section almost always the geological samples a standard. I just do it as a, uh, a standard procedure. I think it's a really good idea. You, run, you learn so much about a rock when you thin section it. And that's what geologists do. They do it always as a first step. Um, and then sometimes to do the geochemistry, I'll do it. Um, I can do on a, on a polished rock sample like for the XRF, or I can take the thin section itself and polish it and look at it under the SEM, the microprobe or the sanding electron microscope, and I can sort of look at the minerals and zap them individually. I don't always need to really go to that level. Most of these rocks are just silica. They have almost nothing to see in them other than some structures and maybe radularia, maybe. Um, so so the, the geochemistry primarily is done sort of on larger rock samples that we polish. And then we, when we have to do the artifacts, since we don't want to cut up the artifact, we are we analyze the artifacts as is and we compare that we compare the geochemistry non-destructively using the xrf but the thing is that for example for for kruger i wasn't able to do that but i i feel pretty good about um about the visual identifications and what i've been doing in the, in the last few years in my publications is i try to provide enough photos and enough description so that anybody with a basic microscope of 20 to 30 you know x can if they have a, if they have a sample next to them if they have a, an actual rock sample next to them of that source should be able to match them you don't need the geochemistry you don't need the thin section i do the thin section because it helps me to explain to people the what they see in the rock like that silicified you know that that sandstone like when you look at it in thin section it's like oh yeah i get it it's like so obvious if the whole story is right there and then it kind of helps us to go back and find, look in the right place. Because I've done a lot of field work looking for that rock in Quebec, by the way, days and days in Quebec as well, found nothing. So now I sort of go back to the geologists, I talk to them again, I say, okay, now that, I, that we think it's this, can you send me in, and they send me in another direction. Um, but yeah, I, th I think that most of, most of the, most of the work that most of us do, I think we can do with just a good comparative collection and a good microscope and just um, like in the case of this publication for Kruger too, you'll have all kinds of photos. There's like dozens and dozens of photos of different, you know, um, magnifications that I think you'll be able to recognize a rock pretty quickly. Like if, it's, if you see that and that together, it's that rock. Okay, good. So. Awesome. Well, that's all the questions that are in the q and A. I'm not sure if there's any more that are coming my way or not, but that answers all the questions I had. Um, I just want to take a moment again to thank you very much for all of this. This is, was a fascinating uh, presentation and a great lecture. Um, I do look forward to the, the book being released. That seems exciting. It is in French. <laughs> I'll have to <laughs> get my dictionary back out from high school. <laughs> I can't pronounce French, but I can read it. Okay. <laughs> Awesome. Um, Yvonne, do you have any closing thoughts? No, that was wonderful though. Thank you so much for that. <laughs> You're welcome. And Thank you. thanks, thanks to you. Thanks to everybody that showed up. I see some names that I recognize and some that I don't. Certainly it'd be nice to meet you in person sometime and go have a beer, some great Vermont beer. I miss it. <laughs> <laughs> My sip of sunshine and all those things, but uh, well, if next year is a little bit different, maybe this will be an in-person and you can come back for part two of this lecture at a brewery or something like that. Exactly. That sounds like a good idea. <laughs> awesome. All right. Well, thanks a lot. Thank you. Have a good okay. night. Good night. Thank you.